I V M. Hey, it's been a great week on IVM Podcast. If you're not following us on social media, please make sure you are. We are IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. This week on Keeping It Queer, Naveen talks to prominent author Devdutt Patnaik to explore queerness as depicted in Indian mythology. On Cyrus Says, Cyrus meets the film critic and writer Rajasthan and the duo quickly descend into a whirlwind of movie references. On LBB Catch a Fun event in Delhi happening soon and a contest lined up for you on the LBB I Found Awesome Podcast. On Hustle Science, hosts Ranveer and Tejaswin talk to entrepreneur Pranav Marwa from Thinkubate about his journey. Also, if you missed last week, make sure you catch Sahil Qatar on their first episode. That was a great show. On Pesa Vesa, if you missed last week's episode, we had a fun back-to-school special episode with a bunch of really smart 10-year-olds who asked Anupam questions about inflation, taxes, and more. Try and listen to as many of these shows as you can. And now, on to your show. Does India need to create 20 million jobs a year? How many are we doing now? India has seen high economic growth since the 2000s. But why hasn't the story been the same with jobs? Welcome to the Pragati Podcast, where we'll answer all this and more. The Pragati Podcast is a weekly talk show on economics, public policy and international relations. We are your hosts, Pavan Srinath and Hamsini Hariharan. Around 2014, India's GDP numbers came under a cloud of suspicion and controversy. In 2018, it's India's employment numbers that are being increasingly contested. My colleague Anupam Manur at the Takshashila Institution joins us again this week, and he's here to help us understand the shape and size of India's jobs challenge. In technical terms, microeconomics is the theory of price, and macroeconomics is the theory of inflation and unemployment. Anupam's a macroeconomist by training, but spends most of his time teaching microeconomics. So I'm sure he's glad to be talking about something closer to macro here with us today. We'll be back with Anupam right after this. Why don't we talk about mental illness? For that matter, we don't even talk about emotional wellness. And if we can't talk about either of these basic, very basic aspects of being human, what do we do when we just feel like something's not right? Hi, I'm Zain. And I'm Avanti. And this is Marbles Lost and Found, a show where we invite conversations about mental health and illness and just get people to talk about it because it's okay to do so. Catch Marbles Lost and Found every Tuesday on the IVM app, website or anywhere you get your podcasts from. Welcome back. In the mid-2000s, many Indians started discussing about the nation's demographic dividend. There was this idea that, well, there are many societies such as the United States and China which are aging. Uh, India had a young population which uh, could grow in time and a large part of India's population could be working and help get India from a low-income or a middle-income economy, maybe all the way to a high-income economy in a generation or two. This culminated for me in 2009, where uh, Nanda Narikani wrote this book called Imagining India, which uh, became quite popular. Uh, it was discussed both in India and abroad, and about how you know, about 20 to 30 million Indians enter the workforce every year or enter a working age population every year. And if India can provide jobs for all of them, then we have this amazing uh, human resource that is not available anywhere else. But if we cannot do that, then it will become a demographic disaster or a demographic bomb. This was back in 2009. And now we are in 2018. And the jobs don't seem to have come in the numbers that we needed. Anupam, What's been happening? Uh, in 2009, I remember this was the last year after a golden run of high economic growth. Right? Uh, is that what is missing? We didn't have economic much economic growth since then. And is that why we have not been able to create the jobs that India needs? I wish that was the answer, uh, because then it would have been uh, quite straightforward to solve. Because uh, achieving 9% GDP growth can still theoretically be done. Uh, but I don't think that's the entirety of the answer. I'm going to start with a grand statement here. For the first time in recorded economic history, we cannot be sure that GDP growth will lead to creation of jobs in large enough numbers. Wow, that's a big, big statement. It is indeed. Right? So, so the standard idea is that economies grow and as economies grow, incomes of people living in that economy also grow. And uh, you can look at per capita GDP as a proxy for per capita income. Right. So 
what has happened is until the 2000s uh, let's say in the 1990s even uh, you could be assured that gdp growth would lead to employment creation uh, in a simple macroeconomic you know uh, cycle that you spoke about which is yeah people get income then they spend it if they spend it then someone has to make things that people want to buy and uh, while doing that they'll have to create factories and then hire people in order to you know produce goods and services uh, but that's no longer the case after the 2000s and, and this is not india centric uh, unfortunately this is the world over and we are caught in in this uh, new game now uh, where the rules have changed so let's just look at the sample you mentioned the you know the late 2000s uh, the second half of the 2000 decade as the golden run for the indian economy you're absolutely right in fact between 2004 5 and 2009 10 we had nearly four years of uh, above 9% gdp growth and that is great numbers for india but do you know how many jobs were created in those five years i don't know 10 million 15 million jobs at least for the whole period you're dreaming it was less than 2 million jobs so that would tell you that in a 5 year period employment actually grew just about 0.3% year on year no for that entire 5 year cumulative period that is abysmally low wow right so uh, and this is the trend in in many parts of the world but india seems to be seeing this more acutely than anywhere else the the country with the largest kind of population working age population somehow doesn't you know is struggling to create jobs uh, despite having economic growth why does that seem to be the case uh, what's happening in the global economy and what's happening in our economy i think there's a global shift towards capital i mean you also have to remember that this is the time when piketty's book for example became so uh, famous right there is some element of you know uh, you can understand why these books become uh kind of popular because the global economy seems to be favoring capital now just imagine this uh india is a labor abundant country we all know that yet most of the companies in india prefer to be capital intensive rather than labor intensive now much of this is our own doing which also should give us hope that we can undo these things which is you know the traditional labor laws etc and let's not go into that uh, just yet but um, it is also a global shift Uh, which favors capital more than owners of capital rather than labor okay and also look at you know in the same period look at where the jobs were created even that 0.3% increase for example um manufacturing jobs actually fell during that period which is you know uh, high productivity salaried jobs actually fell uh, what actually increased was construction workers right which was you know which is generally tends to be in the informal sector and uh, which we, which is generally low paying it, it's on a you know minimum wage kind of basis so even the job growth that came was in in the informal low paying sector rather than you know high paying salaried regular jobs all right but you know i've been looking at the news over the last year or two about employment numbers and everyone seems to be throwing a new number in the air not able to make sense of much of it between 2004 and 2009 the 2 million jobs that you said were created i'm guessing that these were jobs in the formal sector right are we good at counting jobs that are created in the informal sector uh actually in that period it is both the formal and informal jobs that were created because okay wow <laughs> <laughs> all right so so walk me through this how do we look at this thing called a job you know our prime minister also made this famous statement about uh, pakoda sellers so is a pakoda seller uh, uh, i mean does he have a job the answer i i, I would think is a lot more tricky than uh, you know a clear cut definition it's not binary in nature at all and uh, in fact there's there's nearly no consensus on what a job is uh, but i think we can begin to look at jobs on a you know on a simple two axis right one is level of income and the other is the stability of income because you can imagine this now what is recorded as a formal job in india uh, which is you know if you have a contract you come under some kind of labor law regulation and so on right that is considered as a formal job in india yeah i mean a formal job would mean one you're probably paying income tax if not that i think states levy a professional tax, tax. so uh, so that's if you're a professional yeah uh, or um, you know the company that you're working for at least pays tax exactly right. so uh, the company is um registered for gst or does something yeah. right now imagine this scenario there's there's a person who's employed as a peon with the government of karnataka 
it's as formal as it can get it's with the government job but imagine how much salary do they actually draw and it's regular income right uh, and uh, they might be drawing something like 20000 rupees a month or 10000 rupees a month perhaps okay would you consider that as a job sure yeah but the problem is you you have regularity of income but extremely low level of income now you can even imagine in private companies where yeah the company is paying tax etc and they hire uh, you know domestic help that they may pay them you know 5000 rupees or 3000 rupees a month would that be a job then so you know it's all about gradation so it's better to look at this on an axis where or on the other hand you can also imagine a person who's uh, for example has high income but very low stability think of a freelancer who's you know developing high level software uh, he might work just about you know 2 months in a year write something uh, send it out and then you know he might earn 20 lakhs a month according to the government that would be actually an informal job Okay. So formality and informality no longer makes any sense now right because you should now look at you know stability of income and level of income and based on that you can actually classify whether a person has a job or not so now let's come back to our famous pakoda seller imagine that he has a stand which is quite popular he earns about 40000 rupees month on month right and it 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 varies of course let's say it might go to 40 to 50 or it might be 30000 so the range is between 30 and 50000 and this is every month and it's been constant for the last 6 years okay he would be classified as an informal employee right in the informal sector rather somebody else would glorify this person as an entrepreneur right right and is that a good thing bad thing no that's what it, the value judgment i think we should keep away as long as they have a decent level of income and fairly stable and i think that's a job whereas as i said you know you could work for the government uh, be registered under every single uh, you know uh, government agency but then you might be earning extremely low levels of income so both of these things matter okay. right okay what the pakoda seller is missing though is some form of you know uh, pension or come under some kind of labor laws and so on but I don't think he would mind that too much. Right. So then is the more relevant definition that if you are covered under social security then you have some sort of a decent job or a you know good job or a protected one. So for example you have PF you know you're registered therefore with the employment uh, provident fund organization you might have some basic health insurance something like that is that the if you use that criteria again it would be far too restrictive in nature because then with a single stroke of the pen i mean for example the prime minister tomorrow can announce that every person has an insurance coverage of 2 rupees they're insured now they have some form of social security but would that really make any of these people's lives better the answer would be no so again i don't think just going by social security uh, you know that we should be looking at what a job is because a person let's say slightly volatile but high levels of income a person who's earning you know 1 lakh or so a month can do more than enough to actually save up and create his own you know safety net so again i don't think we should go by right. the government so the definitions. subscription to a state provided or a private sector provided safety net is not really is not really the top for, criteria for employment yeah okay uh and yeah i mean now that you say it it also makes sense because uh like the epf requirement is only for companies that have i think more than 10 full time employees exactly yeah so you can be at a high paying company you can just be eight people and all of you might be taking home nice fat salaries but none of you have a pf account exactly exactly and you don't come under most of the labor laws that's there in in india you don't come under uh, uh, a lot of other you know the the company doesn't have to pay proper uh, taxes a uh, lot of their their exemptions for a lot of the taxes and so on so i mean according to those definitions then all of those eight people employed who would probably be earning about let's say 80000 or 1 lakh a month Uh, would all be you know considered informal employees and then you know you'd be trying to formalize them which right. it makes no sense Okay so let's leave this formal informal thing out except that i think many people use some such definition or proxy to calculate numbers yeah. uh so tell me roughly how many jobs are we creating year on year what information do we have do you want the short answer or the long answer it will take about an hour <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's start with the short answer for maybe a little less than an hour okay um of course so th- this is what has been in the debate right um the the prime minister announced that we are creating something like 7 to 15 million jobs a year right and at various points of time uh, there have been people who are 
uh, and unfortunately the entire debate has become so politicized that it it's very difficult to see through the politics and actually arrive at a consensus figure right uh, right because the 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 people who support the government are claiming something like yeah in the range of 7 to 15 that by itself of course is a huge range but then you consider the opposite sector and they're claiming that we are creating no more than you know 0.5 million jobs a year okay. so we are dealing with a range effectively of half a million to 15 million jobs a year okay <laughs> so uh, it, it is kind of difficult to uh, the pick out the right number and say which is the most reliable one which is authentic which is based on you know rigor uh, which has a se- sense of rigor in the estimation and so on but i think we can uh fall back upon some of the 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 statistics of of the government itself uh you know we can look at the the annual labor survey for example and, uh, uh, and and we'll get into the data sources later but i think the consensus figure is something to the tune of 2 million jobs a year okay so this is the increment but what is the level at so we are at probably 1.3 something billion people in the country now right. um a bunch of people would be broadly in the working age range which is some number between 15 and 18 all the way till some number between 60 and 65 right right or even 70 right like i remember one of the arguments being that given that in the, um, human life expectancy is going up there is no reason for people to artificially retire at the age of 60 or 65 so long as they have the ability to work so roughly around 75% of our population of the 1.3 billion is in this working age range that you spoke about which is uh, 16 to 65 right okay. so that comes up to about let's say 950 million people okay right uh, and of that 950 million people of course not everyone is you know working presently because you know some people might be studying some people might be voluntarily out of the workforce etc so the number of people who are willing to work who are in the working age and who are willing to work uh, you call that as the labor force participation rate all right the lfpr right and that in india is about 52% so these are people willing to work and yeah. not necessarily be they're not employed, employed. Yet. okay okay uh, so first things first you uh, we can question why that number itself is so low all right, right. Uh, just to give you an idea comparative statistics 52% is extremely low by the way because uh, just look at some of the comparative stats china there's about 72% okay uh, labor force participation rate uh, and uh, 60% in brazil 62% or so in the us uh, even the south africa has 60% 59. wow so what you're saying is that if every person of the working age was employed then for every working individual in india there'd be less than half a dependent which is kind of amazing right, uh, right. and a dream scenario uh, sure <laughs> but you know there are many countries in which uh, what there are what three dependents even per uh, person who is working you have a lot of children you have a lot of older people uh, so there's not enough people to work Yeah. to make the economy run but what you're saying is because we have only 52% labor force participation this half actually becomes more like 2 2 plus right? right so for every working person you have two dependents yeah and oh, that that's yeah. a very different uh, scene now exactly the the entire scenario changes because of our low working uh, you know the the people who are willing to work the labor force participation rate and uh, and because of that you just have about 470 million out of the 950 odd who are willing to work uh, who are in the working age rather uh, you know that that changes the equation completely okay so these are folk who are willing to work right, right. 52% of 75% of india yeah and uh, how many of them have a job or have some employment so the current unemployment rate is about 4 to 4.5% uh, by uh, okay. in the 2014 15 statistics right okay. which makes it about 450 million people in india are actually employed okay. now if you just look at the 4.5% unemployment rate you would think that we are in an amazing position i mean uh, there are far more you know uh, advanced countries so to speak who have much higher unemployment rates i mean spain for example or the euro area has uh, unemployment rates hovering around 10 to 12% right? right so if you just look at that number you would think that we are doing amazing but the problem is that our labor force participation rate is extremely low and the reason for that is that you know because there are no jobs available people actually drop out of the labor force 
which okay. means that you know since you keep trying for a job you don't get one you get frustrated and then you stop looking for a job once you stop looking for a job then you accounted as not being part of the labor force okay <laughs> so you might be someone who just decides to stay home uh, in a family you decide to become a caregiver instead of a uh, someone who's earning yeah. people make all kinds of choices exactly i mean I, just to show this uh, just to kind of harp on this example let's let's take the example of what happened during the demonetization period just to see the dynamics of the labor force right right um it was as i said about 472 million people who are in the labor force who are willing to work uh then bank november 2016 you had demonetization uh taking place so we had a survey done in sometime about june uh 2017 the labor force had actually shrunk by about 20 million wow so that i mean I, and that is a big drop in in such a short span of time about 7 to 8 months right so that kind of tells you that if there are no jobs available people actually drop out of the labor force okay now you can count that you know the unemployment rate actually shrinks that time but of course it's it's a false success right right uh oh yeah i think i remember the same thing happening in the united states after the 2008 uh, financial crisis exactly right? i think unemployment numbers still managed to look respectable after a point but there were a lot of people who just stopped seeking employment yeah. recessions and and decline in labor force participation rate you know has a very high correlation the the relationship between the two is very tightly knit right as, as soon as you have a recession the economy is looking bad people actually just drop out of the labor force they don't you know they stop searching for jobs because they're Uh, f- you know forecast on the future becomes kind of gloomy so they they just stop looking okay so my one takeaway from this is unemployment rates in india are the stupidest numbers to look at yeah take them out look at the labor force participation rate and actual job creation yes. the levels and the growth yes okay now to your question of uh, you know how many are we actually creating so as i said we are creating about 2 million now the big question is how many do we need to create right right um and and i hope yeah you are sitting down which is nice um we need about 20 million jobs each year wow and we are barely managing to to create about 2 million okay so let me tell you how i arrived at that figure now you have a certain number of people entering into the workforce turning 15 each year right, right. and uh, you assume that about you know a decent labor force participation rate of about 60% Okay. okay the rest of them let's say they want to ca- carry on studying or uh, stay at home or just don't want to work they've you know inherited a big uh, property from their dad right now if that is the case that number is about 12 million people these are the 12 million people who are willing to work and who enter into the labor force participation right okay. each year and then you add in about 6 to 7 million people that you actually need to take out of the agricultural sector which is highly unproductive and then you know give them actually productive jobs so that adds up to about 19 million people and then you actually have to address the f- the stock of the unemployed right? right so there's a lot of people who have you know gone out of the labor force because there are no jobs available now if you start creating jobs these people will enter back into the labor force so you're actually looking at something above 20 million but just to have a round figure let's let's stick with 20 now you also have a few people who might be retiring from the workforce too right exactly so there's there's going to be a few people who are going to drop off the labor force each year so you net all of that and you get yeah let's say 20 wow Okay. 20 million jobs not one time but year on year, year on, on year, year for the next at least 20 years. All right. So the aim is 20 million jobs year on year. You're saying roughly we're doing 2ish million jobs if you want to be optimistic. Uh, well, the government seem to be more optimistic than you. So <laughs> of course I I I think that it's a prerogative to be optimistic about this and also show it in in that light. Okay. But uh, how does this work across gender? um we know that women are not uh, participating in the indian workforce as much as uh, ideally how bad is that situation it is uh, absolutely pathetic uh, as in it will actually fill you with pathos when you hear about the number right only about 27% of the working age women are in the labor force all right uh, and and that is perhaps one of the you know the, the lowest figure in any comparable uh, country i mean I, bangladesh i think has much more I, i don't have the precise number but i remember that bangladesh uh, women labor force participation rate is much higher than this so is this a function of 
like literacy or something like that so if or is it just a function of the income level of the country so <laughs> not really you'd be surprised to know and this is one of the the most uh, widely believed kind of theory out there as to why uh, labor force participation rate among women is so low in india and there's this thing called the j curve okay right so at at lower levels of income and lower levels of education women actually work more if you look at the labor force participation rate there that's about about 40% okay so As, you're talking like say you're a subsistence farming uh, household both the man and the woman i mean both have to work otherwise it's very hard to make exactly anything. or okay. if you think about an urban scenario at at low levels of income uh, women might work as cooks or you know as domestic help or then there's but they have level. to work they have to work right it's more out of necessity now as income starts increasing and as education actually starts increasing women drop out of the labor force they no longer feel that they have to work or the husband no exactly, longer exactly i was about to give i was about to clarify that because this is what a lot of people think that women are voluntarily dropping out of the labor force because they no longer have to work but i would actually lay the blame squarely on our society i mean i know it's it's a, uh, easy and vague and big answer saying okay society is at fault but i think largely in india we know that you know once a woman is kind of educated the family household is uh, income is kind of stable then there's a lot of pressure on the women to drop out of the labor force and and probably attend to other uh, household duties so th- women actually drop out and then after a point again when the women become more independent and they're able to let's say break away from these shackles the labor force starts increasing again so you take a mean of all of this it comes up to about 27% okay thank you anupam for giving us that broad overview of jobs in india Uh, we really want to get down to the data sources and exactly how many jobs india is creating and why different people are claiming different numbers but we'll do all that right after this break hey what's good you guys it's your boy ranveer alabadia from the youtube channel bio biceps and the bio biceps team is bringing you hustle science hustle science is basically a show where we interview hustlers we ask them about what made them legendary we ask them about their success secrets we go to the core of their legendary status in life it's going to be hosted by my boy tejaswin gumbair and yours truly ranveer alabadia make sure you catch hustle science on the ivm podcasting app and website or any kind of podcasting platform that you use to get your podcasts make sure you check it out the episodes are going to be out every single tuesday and we're back anupam you say that india is only creating 2 million jobs a year and so therefore 2 to 20 is a tenfold increase however our prime minister has recently claimed that india might be creating anywhere between 7 and 15 million jobs in which case the size of the problem we need to solve is much smaller so walk us through how various people measure jobs in the economy and um, what they're saying uh let's let's start with i think the most comprehensive data source that is out there right this is the national sample survey organization which uh, conducts probably the most comprehensive kind of survey in india on uh, wages on uh, income levels on uh, employment and unemployment also on consumption right? on consumption as well so uh, it is a big database and let's just concentrate on the employment and unemployment so the the biggest problem however is that uh, this is conducted once in 5 or 6 years okay and then after that it takes about a year after the survey is finished for them to you know actually come out with the results so you know by the time uh, the this number comes out it, it's already too late and it's no longer valid so uh, the last available data set for this is around 2011 12 wow. so let's strike that out as something which is relevant to us now okay I think they had a sense of this problem that you know you need more uh, regular and f- more frequent data on on employment so that you have to you know create policies towards it so the labor bureau d- started conducting the employment unemployment survey and and we have data for this on 2015-16 and okay. and it's done annually so we also have for 2014-15 okay so now let's look at the numbers and how they've changed in in 2014 right the number of workers in india who are employed was 418 million okay according to this figure and uh, by july 2015 however where the next data set was available this number had actually fallen to 467 million 
Okay. Okay. So, and this was before demonetization and so on. Okay. All right. So, uh, according to this survey, the numbers have, have actually fallen. And uh, the the sharpest decline actually came in the employment, uh, in the manufacturing sector. Okay. Right. So, it de- declined from about 51 million to about 48 million. And by the way, 51 million as it is, is a very small number, right? right. Uh, manufacturing in 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 any other country would form a much bigger share of the total workforce. But here it's 50 million out of 480 million. So it, it's a very small number. But even that declined in, in 2015. So tell me something. If you're a farmer in India, and you're not doing anything other than farming. Do you get counted by the survey? Yes, you do. Okay. So 480 million includes, includes the farmers. Wow. And and the huge amount of disguised unemployment that exists as well. So you can, for example, you know, your uh, uncle's farm, you can hang around and probably pluck a, a cherry or two in the entire day and you'd be counted as being employed in this country. Okay. Which is why I, I said that you have to, you know, take out about six or seven million such people out of agriculture and into the more productive jobs. Okay. So we are talking about 480 million as a, if anything, an overestimate, but not an underestimate. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So now let's get on to, uh, uh, you know, more focused kind of surveys that exist. So there's uh, MOSPI, which is the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, does a annual survey of industries. Now, uh, unfortunately, this is, or, you know, they, they focus only on the industries, uh, on the manufacturing sector, and even there on firms which employ more than 20 people. Okay. So a huge uh, set is actually not collected because right. this, on, this is the your sense of the formal jobs. Okay. All right. So, uh, and even there, it's, it's a kind of damning figure, right? Because between 2013-14 and 14-15, uh, only about 3 lakh jobs were created in the manufacturing sector. Formal okay. jobs in the manufacturing sector. Alright, Anupam. So, we have one data source which is more than 6-7 years old. Yeah. Therefore, irrelevant for policy debates. Uh, you have another data set which uh, between 2 years and the mid 2010s uh, actually declined the overall uh, number of working folk from 480 million to 467 million yeah. and more specifically in manufacturing jobs were cut by 3 million yeah you have one more survey which looks at a subset of this manufacturing industry and you found that there was an increase or a decrease of 3 lakhs. An increase of 3 lakhs. And th- that is 0.3 million, which is, again, minuscule in, in what we are actually talking about. All right. right. What other measures are there? Um, just before we go on to the other measures, I just want to now take a slightly broader look because we have the annual survey of industries for quite some time. Uh, it, it's also good to see what's been happening since the 2000s, right? Okay. Um, interestingly... And remember, this is when I said, you know, from 2000 is when the GDP kind of employment correlation has fallen. Uh, So it's interesting to look what has happened there. Between 2000 and 2014, the share of contract workers has actually gone up. And the share of salaried workers, so regular formal jobs has gone down over this entire period. Okay. Right. Uh, And I have the numbers here, but, you know, contract workers increased from 16% to 26%. And proportionately, you know, direct employed workers decrease from 62 to 51%. So there's, you know, all what this means is that we are actually heading towards more informalization of the economy over this, this period, 2000 to 2014, which means that, you know, it, it's the quality of jobs are worse. Uh, you have no benefits, you have no, you know, uh, kind of regular income and so on. So this is even before the whole idea of a gig economy came into the being. Much right? before, This yeah. is not technology-enabled Uber or Swiggy or some other type of job. Not at all. Okay. So what has happened, and I, I and I think all of this reflects in you know in the mood in 2014, right? Uh, let's kind of tie this in with the larger narrative, right? And and because that is when. Uh, uh, Prime Minister said that we want more formalization of the economy because for the last 14 years, there's actually been an informalization or rising share of informal share of, uh, you know, employment in the economy. Right. So, and I think that was partly why, you know, which explains your GST and demonetization as well, right? And uh, it's also because of that particular employment scenario is when I think a lot of the you know, the schemes that were launched initially also explains this or is explained by this because you had Make in India, again, thrust towards manufacturing, probably salaried manufacturing and better paying manufacturing jobs. You had smart cities, which will boost 
construction at least in the beginning and then other forms of services and uh, manufacturing and so on so i think a lot of the policies that were initially framed in 2014 was was addressing all of these background problems okay okay uh, never mind how well those policies did and uh, no we'll not get there <laughs> okay let's not go there so we have one other data source which specifically looks at the the informal sector okay but unfortunately again this is done once in 5 years all right so you have the unincorporated non agricultural enterprises survey okay okay so and, and this also excludes construction okay so it's other forms of uh, informal employment and uh, this as i said it it corresponds with what i was saying in the previous survey as well uh, the share of informal economy has actually grown i mean number of people employed has gone up from about 34.88 million to 36.04 million okay and then of course we'll go on to the biggest data set right or or at least the most controversial one in the recent times which is the payroll data set or the epfo accounts okay so this is by the employment provident fund organization yeah and i think they opened up their data set to a couple of uh, researchers yes only to a couple of researchers at the beginning and this has done, been done for the first time right yes. the full data set has yeah. been opened up otherwise i think we just get fairly crude numbers yeah. year on year yeah Okay. So the first time this was opened up only two researchers were kind of privy to this information and this data set and they came up with a, a research paper uh, which kind of claimed that we were you know in in 2017 18 we actually created about 7 million jobs wow 7 million formal jobs because these were counted in the EPFO data Okay. and which means that if if our share of the economy is about 80 20 right 80 informal and 20 formal and if you are creating 7 million jobs then you can imagine how many informal jobs we are supposed to be creating just using this logic sure. let's take a 1 is to 1 ratio by this measure we must be at least creating 14 to 15 million jobs which is the number that is generally uh, you know used by the 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 optimists let's call them that okay <laughs> uh I mean this sounds great what uh, is the problem with this data um multiple problems right okay. uh, firstly this data set was not available for anyone else to cross verify until much much later on and even now there there's some problems with the data set itself so uh the the biggest problem i think is the selection of the time period as a sample to do this so they selected one time period looked at how many new epf accounts were created in that time period and then extrapolated that over the years and and said that okay this many jobs are created now this happened to be just during the demonetization and gst phase okay. when a lot of the uh, companies decided to formalize their employment engagements right so a lot of people actually became formal because of these two effects and they opened up epf accounts okay right and and the i think the figure is that epfo added about 10.13 million subscribers to its pool between 1st january and 30th june 2017 and this was also done by the way during an amnesty scheme that they had okay so it's kind of clever by half so they try to uh, they say that we factored this in and we have uh, correspondingly reduced the numbers but i i don't think they've done enough of it and epf for example if i'm working at one company and i'm drawing a salary and therefore i have a pf account uh, if i shift to, to another company don't i need to start a second pf account i'm i'm glad you brought this up because i I actually looked into how this whole mess of EPF accounts work. I myself don't have one, so I had to, you know, ask people who did. Now, uh, presently, you have, uh, you know, they've started a unique account. You know, like your okay. PAN, it's linked to your PAN, so you have one account which uh, goes across the companies. But this was done after the the data period that they looked at. Okay. But before that, yes, largely, if you know, you shifted from one company to the other, you had to open another PF account, and which would mean that you know that would be taken as one new job created right so that's another problem the third thing is regarding the age so you can open an epf account only at the age of 19 okay so you can be employed from the age of you know let's say 15 to 18 and then you turn 19 you open an epf account that'll be create you know that'll be counted as one job created though it's not it's just the person becoming 19 he's right. working the same thing as he was doing before right right so that again is duplicitous it's also the same when a company goes from size uh, exactly. 9 to size 10 right yeah. or 19 to 20 whatever the relevant number is so your 19 employees uh, you know and and suddenly you hire one more person now you'll be counted as you know that you have created 20 new jobs 
But not just created, one, but you created just one you've new created job. One. Okay. And so all of these are our uh, problematic areas. And and think about this. There's also a lot of, you know, dead EPF accounts. Right. So uh, EPFO has, let's say, uh, about 170 million accounts, of which there are only 50 million active users. Okay. So you look at all of this, and it's a very problematic uh, area, right? And so the numbers that come out of a database which has so many problems, I'm not sure how how much you can actually trust it. And and by the way, this has been ripped apart and torn apart by by analysts who are much better at the numbers than I am. Okay. So okay. apart from the government, pretty much no serious analysts and economists are Take, believing yeah, this number. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it's only the government who loves this, of course, because it's it's very positive for them. But no one else is taking it seriously. And uh, but. Let me also say that there's only one positive about what happened with the EPFO debacle, right? I think we should, in time, move towards a payroll data, payroll reporting data, which means that we'll get a lot more consistent data, we'll get reliable data, and we'll get it, you know, frequently, right? So you can actually base policies on that. So if, for example, the EPFO, the entire database is synchronized and you remove all the duplicate accounts, it, it takes a bit of doing. But once you do that, then you can actually get month on month data on how many jobs are created, how many jobs are lost, what is the wage rate and so on, right? And that can be great for policy making. Just to give you an example, I mean, in the first Friday of every month, the, the US gets its payroll data. Okay. And that one single number moves the entire... US economy, right? Stock markets react immediately to that. The dollar, you know, either falls or rises according to that. And then, I mean, big decisions, policy decisions are made based on the latest uh, payroll data. And not just that, the world economy, in fact, moves to that because people are anticipating what it is. Right. Right. It comes out on Friday morning, eight o'clock, if I'm not mistaken, in the US. So evening, wherever the markets are open, they're immediately reacting to it. So that's how important a, a single number can be. I mean, the jobs number. So currently, what the only number of that sort in India, which gets that kind of attention are your quarterly and annual GDP figures, right? Yeah, quarterly and annual GDP figures and then inflation rate, if you're, you know, particularly bothered about that. That's more for monetary policy, but not really for on a, you know, Sure. Yeah. But those are the only numbers that uh, generates that kind of excitement and interest as well. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. So, and it's very much a thing of you only pursue what you measure, right? So if we don't measure this well, or if we start measuring this well, we can dramatically change policy focus too. Exactly. I, and I think, again, going back to the 2000s, right? Uh, because we were measuring GDP and that number was coming out, we were in fact in, in a blissful state of ignorance. We we were very happy that we were growing at 9%. And yes, that is something to be happy about. But since we don't measure uh, employment data, we didn't really pay attention to it at all. There were a few commentators who kept saying this is jobless growth, this is jobless growth, but they didn't have evidence to back it up. It was not until the NSS survey, which was done in 2011-12, that we actually got a sense of how many jobs were created in the past decade. Right. And it was only then that Manmohan Singh, the previous prime minister, actually said, yes, I think we did not create enough jobs. And there was admission of that. And uh, then there were policy measures in order to kind of uh, beat that. OK, so I, I just want to think through this one point. So supposing you have the economy which is growing at a certain high percentage and you don't have a corresponding job growth. Does it mean that there's a lot of wage growth that those who are working have, are seeing their incomes rise as high as the economic growth or is it going towards a return to, I don't know, stockholders and people who own the money? So, a very interesting question. It is actually a bit of both. Now, we have seen huge productivity gains in certain sectors in the economy. Okay. Right. And so with the productivity gains, it comes, you know, higher wages. But that is a very small section of the economy. Right. Uh, but what has happened is, uh, you know, this is what uh, the favorite bashing point of uh, for leftists and so on against the capitalists, which is money is actually gone towards capital and not towards labor. Uh, so and and as I said, most firms in India are strangely capital intensive in nature. So even if you open up a small factory, Instead of hiring, you know, X number of laborers, you'd prefer to hire a costlier machine to do the work for you uh, rather than actually hire laborers. And that goes into, you know, all our labor laws and, and problems with that. So, uh, yeah, I think the large part of the gains is, is 
gotten towards a very small section which are the people who own capital okay thanks anupam for providing that overview of different sources of calculating how many jobs india is creating and how those numbers don't necessarily agree with each other but i'm still not quite sure how you came up with this number of how india is making 2 million jobs a year which data source tells us that <laughs> unfortunately no single data source tells us that uh, the closest is the annual uh, employment unemployment survey by the labor bureau which told you that number of jobs actually decreased uh, but uh, it's again not a very comprehensive data set it's got its own lacunas and they're building it it's been done since i think 2010 or so so there's still you know they have to perfect that particular thing and the only other most comprehensive data set is the nss data set which occurs once in 6 years so that can't tell us anything reliable so the way i came up with this 2 million job is i actually read a lot of papers who what they do is basically they uh, figure out you know they they take these different surveys out there uh, or with comparable frequencies to you know preferably year on year and they take you know data from the unemployment uh, sorry unorganized sector they take data from the formal sector they take data from the the industry and manufacturing and services and they you know tie it all up using maths and wizardry right okay. so uh, and and i read across about 10 to 15 such reports and uh, the consensus seemed to be around this range right about 0.5 million which is the lowest that i found and up to about 4 million or so which uh, was the highest so you know just take a poly average and you get about 2 million jobs but it could be anywhere between that so uh, if if you want uh, probably a one of the most comprehensive papers out there which takes you know data from all of the sources that i mentioned plus uh looks at employment elasticity of growth and does their own math wizardry and then looks at national statistics and you know uh i think the most comprehensive paper out there which ties in all of these different data sources together is a paper called uh, waiting for jobs okay. by radhika kapoor right. I, i would highly recommend it to anyone who is interested in this topic okay uh thanks anupam so before we let you go uh, i know that it's beyond the scope of our discussion today on how do we fix this problem and how do we actually bring 2 million jobs a year to 20 million <laughs> but maybe paint a picture paint an outline of the kinds of things we should be thinking about to do this 2 to 20 shift let me actually start with a negative let me tell you what not to do Okay right um i think we should be brutal and and kill all the holy cows and and sacred things about the indian economy right so no more small scale industry no more hand looms and cottages and cottage industries and and uh, all of that has not delivered jobs in the last 60 years there's uh, nothing that should you know give us hope that it'll create start creating jobs now right um, self employment and entrepreneurship we we claim that it's doing well but in fact most 90% of the self employed employs just one person which is himself okay. so it's not really a source of job creation as well um protectionism is not the answer that's never been the answer we i think we've dealt with that in another um, you know uh, another episode of uh, pragati podcast uh, so i mean these are the traditional ideas that we thought would get us jobs but i i am saying that none of them actually work okay. right um the the kind of shift towards manufacturing through the make in india and the smart cities government were supposed to be the new ideas that would create jobs and in in its inception it is a good idea but again absolutely faulty implementation not thought through and so on didn't deliver the jobs right so um first i would say that we have to remove people from agriculture because that's very low productivity for that you need cities which can absorb these people big cities which can you know give jobs and these can be you know even specialized cities it, there's tourism there is you know whole bunch of uh, specialized cities university towns that you can create that can you know provide jobs and and ultimately i think the the biggest thing is of course labor laws i mean you have to just destroy the entire set of labor laws have as minimum provisions as possible and the government is thinking of doing that i mean the code on wages bill for example they uh, they combined a whole set of labor laws which were relating to remuneration into one law and i think you have to do that across the board for all sets of labor laws and of course your ease of doing business these are the known answers but the problem though is that all of these known answers 
right uh which everyone say is is in broad agreement with that you know abolish labor laws or at least simplify them uh do ease of doing business even if you do all of that i don't think we can get to the 20 million okay that will still fall short which means that you need to radically reorient your macroeconomic policy and overall other policies towards job creation uh instead of anything else Oh okay. uh, if not uh, it would be an extremely dire situation you have lots of people who are unemployed who are not even looking for jobs they will you know if if uh, poverty and that is one extreme but then you know the government in order to kind of combat that will have to do massive redistribution uh, nrg when it started out was a response to this job crisis right and uh, and so are the the fact that it was continued until now is also that it's uh, this thing we are already talking about ubi universal basic income as one of the solution so you know if we don't fix this problem and if we don't fix it soon then we'll have to redistribute and if we redistribute then there just will not be enough for people to actually invest uh, and yeah, and it's very tough to redistribute when you have a couple of thousand dollars <laughs> exactly, per person exactly the pie is not very big for it to be cut Uh, and, many and, different ways yeah and the minute you start cutting that pie up into smaller this thing the pie actually shrinks right so that is the kind of dire situation we're looking at and the worst outcome is that you know you will have increased uh, social kind of uh, uh, disorder you'll have violence increasing crimes and all sorts of things right if you have you know a 20 year old who just can't find a job or who can't earn enough you look at the kind of options that are available yeah i mean it's interesting india has never faced a large uh, threat from unemployed individuals right we've never seen a scene in india the way um, we saw in greece yeah when there was crazy unemployment spain has crazy unemployment and that is visible in the kind of politics that they have and so on right in india it always seems to be a little hidden but uh, maybe what we see as a labor protest in the west we see as farmers agitation in india exactly. which is on the rise yeah with a visible from tamil nadu to maharashtra yeah. to uh, now karnataka is talking about a loan waiver and other things so there is i think i guess a lot of farming is disguised unemployment unemployment exactly and then uh, the other kind of uh, place where it raises its head is in calls for reservation that's again because of unemployment if everyone had a job i doubt if people would be asking for special status right so various caste grouping so exactly. caste seems to be one one way to ring one fence one manifestation and right? one way to ring fence yeah. uh, calls for new jobs yeah. right? and you have enough dissatisfied communities in probably every single indian state precisely and all of them are using whatever little political clout they have to demand uh, yeah. for entitlements of one sort or the other yeah and it only get worse down the road On okay. that optimistic note, <laughs> on that optimistic note, uh, thank you so much, Anupam. It was my uh, pleasure coming in. Thanks. And that's the show for the week. Thank you for staying with us till the end. If you have any questions or comments, do write in to podcast at thinkpragati dot com, and we'll answer your questions in a future episode. Get over to thinkpragati dot com to read about how India is engaging the world. You can subscribe to the Pragati podcast on the IBM podcast app or wherever you get your podcast from. We are there everywhere. There she stands. A podcast addict. Outside the bank, having traveled several miles to get in with other poor souls like her. The journey though daunting for this youngling will have some comfort because she has downloaded her favorite podcast. You can see more of her species on ivmpodcasts.com. Your one-stop destination where you can check out the coolest Indian podcasts. Happy listening.